الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلام عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما مزيدا قال الله عز وجل بعد أن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Dear brothers, this month many communities, many khatibs around the country and in fact around the world have been discussing and raising awareness about the 20 year milestone of the existence of Guantanamo Bay. This is something that many of us forgot about and the, the prisoners therein. But it's something that has been amongst advocates of justice, Muslim and non-Muslim, around the world. It's been an ongoing issue. It's been an ongoing affront to justice, the rule of law, due process. And this is something we as Muslims should be doubly concerned with. Not just the fact that anyone suffering injustice anywhere, we should make a noise about that. We have a divine duty, an imperative from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By Dint of us being Muslims. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas. You are the best people. You are the best nation raised for mankind. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. You enjoin what is right. You speak out against what is wrong. And you're mu'mins, you believe, you have iman in Allah. So from one perspective, anyone suffering injustice anywhere, we have to be at least feeling that we want to raise awareness, we want to speak out against injustice. Whether it's Muslim, non-Muslim, even if it's not even a human being, if it's injustice against animals or any creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the second reason we need to pay particular attention to this is that everyone who's in that camp is a Muslim. And they're routinely subjected to desecration of their deen. The desecration of the Mus'haf for example. The uh, torture based on their Islamic values. In terms of sexual abuse and so on and so forth. So, this is something that has been an affront and a crisis on an international scale. The most infamous symbol of kidnapping, torture, extrajudicial rendition without due process, without rule of law. And I was thinking when the 20th anniversary came about of this and there was a lot of media attention and so forth and people speaking out against this, this crime against humanity. I was thinking, what is our message? 
What are we supposed to be thinking about? What are we supposed to be offering the world in terms of what our narrative is about us? And personally, when I was reflecting on it, I, I feel that there are four things that we need to think about when we're talking about injustices like Guantanamo Bay. Something that's so almost unanimous from left wing, right wing, people across the world, governments, international community are united in condemning this. One of the lessons that we need to bear in mind, in my opinion, that we need to keep reminding ourselves that people are not the same. The non-Muslims, for example, who are working to close down this affront to justice, they're non-Muslims. But they are some of the most active people when it comes to speaking out against these types of injustices. And we should find people who have a natural, from the fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them, or from the remnants of previous prophets and, and other religions and so forth, that they, they, they care about justice. We should find these people and work together with them. Come together on a common cause. A film was recently made <clears throat> based on the story of one of the prisoners who was kidnapped from uh, Mauritania. And they obviously illegally renditioned and sent to Guantanamo Bay, underwent torture and persecution and so forth. But the true story was made in a, in, a, in a Hollywood film and you can see some of the characters faithfully portrayed, the, the, the real life characters, and how they even went through uh, and suffered themselves and destroyed their own careers, put their own careers on the line in order to help people. For example, the the military lawyer who was uh, given the task of trying to justify why this person is you know, uh, receiving the treatment he has been, he flat refused. He felt, he felt a sense because he was a Christian and he's in church on Sunday, he's hearing messages about how Christianity and, and to be a righteous person, you have to stand up for justice. He could not reconcile that with his own faith and his own natural sense of justice. And he refused to prosecute that man. In that time, in that era, in that culture, someone from the military refusing an order like that from his superior, that is putting a massive bullseye on your own self. But he went through that at personal cost. He spoke out and he refused to be part of the oppression of this Muslim man. He didn't know if he was guilty, innocent, or whatever. It's not about someone being guilty or innocent. This is about justice not being given. This is about the process of justice and the rights of people not being given. And ain't, you know, being subjected to ancient medieval forms of torture routinely. Just like that person portrayed in that film, there are many millions, if not hundreds of millions of other people, not even Muslim, but they, they feel that sense of justice, that duty to uphold justice and speak out and not be at least a silent bystander. We need to work with people like this on all types of causes. They are not the same. In fact, the people who are actively doing the oppression, I would say a minority of people. And the, just, the arc of justice is long, but it always bends towards justice. The second thing I wanted to, I was reflecting on, was that for any type of evil, especially something that is systemic on this, this scale, this scale of suffering and, and injustice meted out against people. Or it requires one thing from the general public, public. It requires, in order to exist, in, in order for any suffering to exist, any oppression of one human against another, for that to continue, for that to survive, it requires the general public to be bystanders. We don't think about this too much when we're talking about 
And when you see on your new on the news that the, the, the levels of oppression that a human being can give to another human being. If his nafs isn't regulated, if his activity is not regulated by some kind of value, some kind of particularly divinely inspired values. People commit all kinds of atrocities against each other, especially those in power against the weak. This has been since time immemorial. But we all realize that when some oppression is happening, there are there are obviously the person who's doing the oppression, number one. The perpetrator, the, the, the victim, number two. The rescuers sometimes, those who can go in and actually help those people. But we all ignore the fourth type of person, which is probably the, 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 the type of person that the majority of us are at risk of falling into. The type of person the majority of us are at risk of becoming. Because Alhamdulillah, we're not, none of us, inshallah, is actively involved in oppressing someone. But we might fall into that fourth category, which is being a bystander. Which is being a spectator to suffering. In order for any oppression to exist and flourish, you need to have spectators and bystanders. Who know what is happening, but they refuse to become rescuers. They refuse to make noise. And some of them, in their refusal, they become just like the perpetrators. They become just like those who are perpetrating the suffering. So we cannot say in good conscience that at least I'm not doing the suffering. But if you see the oppression happening and you stay silent, you don't even bother to raise an awareness about that, then we should be very, very, very afraid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us again and again that the, the line between the spectator and the perpetrator is very murky. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, Ya ayyuha alladhina amnust istajibu lillahi wa lirrasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum Oh, you who have believed, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger when they invite you, when they call you. وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِ وَأَنَّهُ إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ And know that Allah intervenes between the, a man and his heart. Allah knows everything that's happening inside you, the thoughts. And know that to Him you certainly shall return. Then what does Allah say? The famous ayah. وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةَ لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْحِقَابِ And as for those who are not responding to what Allah is telling you to do, to, to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands, and you can see from the context, it's in the context of oppression, the wrong that's happening around you, or dhulm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and fear a tribulation that will not exclusively afflict those who are among you who are doing oppression. It won't only exclusively afflict them. Fear a tribulation and know that Allah is severe in His punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. But look how He is warning us of this danger. The ulama of tafsir, they say, this involves those people who see the oppression happening. They see wrong happening around them, but they don't try to fix it. They don't speak out against it. If a punishment, if a trial, a tribulation comes, it won't only just afflict those who are doing the oppression with their hands. It will afflict those who are standing and watching it happen. And the opposite is true as well. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ لِيُهْلِكَ الْقُرَى بِظُلْمٍ وَأَهْلُهَا مُسْلِحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And your Lord would never punish or destroy a people or a town 
because of their injustice or out of injustice, whilst their people are Muslimun. Whilst there are among them people who are calling out and trying to fix the oppression. Those of us who reflect, anyone who can reflect on history, anyone who can reflect on the, 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 the sign, the sunnah of Allah, the kind of cosmic universal truths about this earth, they know that oppression at some point or another leads to destruction. This is something almost a truism. Any, any historian who reflects on this will see this, that oppression, it might linger for a bit, Allah might give it, rest, the people respite, but eventually oppression leads to destruction. But Allah prevents destruction happening if there are some people in those towns working to fix that oppression. Therefore, by implication, if the people are not standing up and working towards fixing that, then the destruction will come and may wipe them all out. And there are many ayat and hadith to this effect. So we Muslims have an obligation. Even if it wasn't, uh, uh, the, the camp wasn't full of Muslims, even if it were non-Muslims, even if it were a different type of creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even human, that was being tortured, that was being oppressed to that extent, we have an obligation to at least try to work towards rectifying the situation. And then in the next khutbah, I want us to reflect on a, two more of these lessons and how we can actually do that. إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We're talking at the twentieth anniversary of the global symbol of kidnapped and torture and extraordinary. An extrajudicial rendition with, that is Guantanamo Bay. And we said that one of the lessons when you think about this, this issue, this crime, is that people are not the same. Some of the biggest advocates of justice are non-Muslims and we need to work with people who have a sense of justice and work on common causes like this. The second thing we mentioned was that for any oppression to exist, it requires bystanders. It requires people who are just spectators of suffering. They know something bad is happening, but they, they distract themselves. They turn the other, uh, they turn their eyes away. And they, in doing so, they become almost collaborators to that injustice. And something which is linked to this is what one, the third lesson I want to reflect on, and that is what one author one theorist called the banality of evil. The banality of evil. You see, when we think of people who are responsible for the oppression and the in deliberate suffering and killing of maybe millions, we might think of someone who looks like a monster, someone who's <coughs> frothing at the mouth, someone who's rambling, someone who's crazy. But it turns out that these are just civil servants. They're just quote unquote normal looking people. That in a, a genocide or in a holocaust, it's just the doctors and nurses and the civil servants and the engineers and the accountants that turn into, because of the environment that they're in, they turn into such quote unquote monsters, but just doing their job, following orders, carrying on their daily business as usual. This is something we all need to be wary of because we're thinking, we're conditioned to think by literature, by films, by programs that the villain is someone who's ugly, the villain is someone who's got an eye patch or a hook for a hand or he's got some kind of crazy vendetta against someone. No, the true villain, the true perpetrators of intergenerational long-term suffering and deliberate oppression are people wearing suits in boardrooms, drawing maps, drawing lines on maps. This is what evil actually looks like. And until we realize that, 
we'll be looking in the wrong place for what our duty is to demand people who are responsible for oppression to make change. And one of the reasons that these, these types of systemic issues can persist is we as a people, we've abandoned, as a general public, we've abandoned holding our leaders, for example, to account, holding powerful people to account, enjoining good, forbidding evil, speaking out against evil. And this is one of the greatest lessons about tyranny, especially in the last century. There were so many examples of tyranny flourishing. And one of the, the causes of that is the general people becoming apathetic to what's happening around them, becoming distracted or becoming too scared to speak out. These two, this, this polarity existed in, 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 in even our literature of people either being so distracted and entertained, entertaining themselves to death, or people being so subjected to such harsh surveillance that they're afraid to, they've, they've made themselves fear and stop talking out against injustice, for example. So, number three, lesson number three is, don't look for an evil, monstrous looking person when you're trying to make some change. The banality of evil. And number four, the fourth lesson, is that if we're not careful about this, this the, the, the routine, the mundane banality of evil persisting, we will slip back into a pre-Islamic jahiliyyah. Before Islam was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, before its influences and impact on the rest of the world, how was the culture of justice and crime and punishment? Muslims need to lead once again, because we're slowly slipping back into that. Before the advent of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, if someone powerful accused someone, if someone powerful wanted to oppress someone, they would just do it. Accuse them of something, say these people are witches, these people are this, these people are that, magicians. Like we're given the Pharaonic model, and Musa alayhi salam and Harun are coming, they say what? The, 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 the Pharaoh and his chiefs, they say what? قَالُوا إِنْ هَذَانِ لَسَاحِرَانِ يُرِيدَانِ أَنْ يُخْرِجَاكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ وَيَذْهَبَ بِطَرِيقَتِكُمُ الْمُثْلَى These two, they're magicians, they've come to expel you from your land. Don't listen to what they're saying. They are a threat to your national security, in other words. They want to do away with your, your exemplary way or your, your nobility. You could easily, in that era, just accuse someone of being an evil person and people will just look the other way and allow you to oppress them. In this country itself, only a few hundred years ago, if someone were to accuse you of a crime, there's no court system. They would tie you, the trial would be what? Tie you to something heavy and throw you in a canal. Set fire to you. Trial by ordeal. But then the Prophet ﷺ, when he came along, he brought back, brought people back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's requirement for us and how we treat accusation, how we treat people accused of crimes, for example, and justice and crime and punishment. When he said, for example, Al Bayinatu al Mudai, Al Yaminu ala man anka. A simple statement that shape that changed the shape and culture of the legal landscape across the world. That the proof, the burden of proof is on the one who makes a claim. If you accuse someone of something, you have to bring proof. Until then, he is presumed innocent. The presumption of innocence, for example. This is being slowly eroded away. Legally, politically, socially and culturally. Someone might say something and people just attack them and they destroy their reputation, for example. This is happening on many levels and Muslims need to take a lead on this in bringing people back to a more uh, uh, values that are more in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine values. And once we do this, we can, once we have that sense of, that of duty in us, we will begin to lead again 
inshallah. And speak out, for example, when you see this, or any type of oppression on our social media. Support and spread the news of anything that's happening. We can use our money, our wealth to donate to causes and organizations that are working towards justice. We can utilize any skills that we have. If you're, if you're a writer, you can write. Use that. If, you, if you're an artist, use that skill. If you're a businessman or an entrepreneur, use that skill. And finally, but last but not least, make dua. We need to make dua. But at least we can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I made dua to you, Ya Allah, because I didn't have any way of rescuing, becoming a rescuer. I made dua, Allah, make me a rescuer. Allah, let me help. Allah, alleviate the suffering of these people who are being oppressed and those people who are being oppressed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find a way for us all. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to speak out against injustice. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna wa fi al-akhirati hasna wa qina adab al-naq wa afu anna wa akhulana wa alhamna anta maulana fa nsuna ala al-qawm kafeen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala ibn Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jma'in. Ma'akinu salam.